Uh, hi everyone, uh, welcome to this week's um, Geobiology Seminars. Um, for anyone who's joining for the first time, this is a joint initiative um, from the University of Bristol between um, the schools of Air Sciences, that's me, and with Patricia sanchez Baracaldo, who's in Geography. And we are really excited today because we've got uh, one of our own joining us um, to give a seminar, so our, our first internal speaker of this semester. Um, and that'll be James Byrne. Um, so he's a senior lecturer in the School of Air Sciences. Um, he actually originally did um, his undergraduate studies in physics and then discovered the wonders of biology and did his PhD in geomicrobiology at the University of Manchester. Um, after that, he was in Germany for quite a lot of years um, as a postdoc and then as a junior group leader, uh, working on all sorts of aspects of iron cycling and now he's uh, just recently moved to Bristol um, where he's building his new group and taking lots of exciting new research directions. So welcome James, thanks for joining and um, if you want to share your screen and can get Will started. Do. Right. Is that showing up okay for everybody? Yep. Yeah, great. All right, thanks very much, Casey uh, and Patricia, for uh, inviting me to give this talk today. Uh, as Casey mentioned, I've just started in Bristol. In fact, I only started in uh, April, which is, right, I guess, now the beginning of the pandemic. So it's been an interesting start. Uh, so today I want to talk to you about some elements of my work, which is really covering the stuff that I did before I came to Bristol, um, although I'm still very much working on this, this area. Uh, and in particular, I'm focused on environmental mineralogy and geomicrobiology. And today I want to talk to you about micro-mineral interactions, in particular from the perspective of iron biomineralization and electron exchange. And uh, this is my first Zoom conference, I guess, uh, a talk that I've given. So uh, I'm trying to keep it simple and keep it light. I've got quite a few pictures I want to show to you and also just cover a few different areas or a few different projects that I've worked on over the years. Now, of course, we're talking about iron or I'm talking about iron. And it's always important to think about where exactly iron is. And well, it is in fact everywhere, of course. We have evidence of iron mineralization uh, in pretty much every environment you go to. Uh, here, for example, I was in Santa Gracia last year in, in Chile, and the project here was to look at some, well, iron within the, the bedrock. Um, but interestingly, we just had to walk a short distance and see some gullies where we could uh, observe these interesting features where we saw this very dark looking sand material uh, and I happened to have a magnet with me so I stuck it in the ground and uh, was able to pull out this um, amazing material which you can see follows the field lines of the magnet which I used to extract the material from and I just wanted to show this picture partly because I, I really like it um, but also because it demonstrates just how prevalent and how much iron there is in any different environment. And so of course, iron is one of the most abundant elements in the Earth's crust. It is redox active, uh, having the iron two and the iron three oxidation states, which are so important to our research. It's also excellent at binding metals and nutrients, uh, which helps of course with binding uh, pollutants or contaminants in drinking water, for example. And of interest to me specifically, and many of you, I guess, uh, it is bioavailable. So many, well, pretty much everything is able to use iron to some extent. And of course we see iron everywhere. Here is a, um, a colleague provided this photo of the Yunnan province in China where you could see a really highly orange looking soils, which are really enriched in iron minerals. As it is again, these were magnetic. Um, magnetic tends to be a theme that I'm most interested in. And uh, these, these minerals were in fact probably more maghemite mixed with hematite and maybe a little bit of magnetite as well. But we see evidence of iron in all different environments we go to. But I'm particularly interested in iron biomineralization, the influence of microbial activity in the formation of iron minerals. And here, for example, you can see uh, an iron-rich spring or this, this pipe which is allowing uh, ferrous iron to come out of a mountain somewhere in Switzerland, and you see these amazing orange films forming. And you might be fooled into thinking that a lot of this is induced by abiotic oxidation. Of course, it's the ferrous iron is coming into contact with air. But if you were to look carefully or closely, 
you would see a significant proportion of cellular activity or different types of bacteria that are involved in producing these different um, microbial iron mats. Of course, there is some abiotic influence as well, but the bacteria are hugely uh, involved to a great extent in, in this mineralization. And you see it in all walks of life. You, you, I'm sure many of you, in fact, all of you, have gone walking in a, in a field or some different area and you see these orange sort of precipitates leaching from the soil or the side of the path. And in many cases, these are going to be directly related to biomineralization processes, this involvement of the bacteria in building um, different structures. And that's very important for understanding modern environments but the processes that have led to this, these different iron mineralization products is also responsible for what we see in banded iron formations. And uh, Kirk Conhauser gave an excellent talk last week talking about the involvement of microbial redox cycling in uh, BIF genesis. Uh, and of course, the processes that we see today are still are fundamentally linked to those which happened in ancient environments. But let's just think about what actually happens in some of these subsurface environments and what are the main key players that we, can, that we need to investigate. Well, I'm just going to talk about neutrophilic conditions here, so I'm not talking about any acidophilic uh, bacteria involvement, but I want to focus on the microbial iron redox cycle at neutrophilic conditions. Of course, we have iron 2 and iron 3 that are present in different forms. They could be present in aqueous species, in polycrystalline species, um, and of course you have mineralized um, forms of iron. We have the iron oxidation where we're simply going from iron 2 to iron 3 and of course the reverse case where we have the reduction going from iron 3 to iron 2. On the oxidation half of this cycle we have three main key players that we consider when we're looking at um, microbial iron oxidation. We have microaerophiles. These use micromolar concentrations of oxygen so they only exist at the anoxic oxic boundary. But nevertheless, they can actually outcompete with abiotic oxidation, and they produce some very interesting shapes, which I'll show you in a minute. We have phototrophic iron 2 oxidizing bacteria, which require sunlight in order to facilitate their iron oxidation. And then we have another interesting group, the nitrate reducing iron oxidizers. So they take nitrate, and this is coupled to the oxidation of iron. These are interesting because for a while, this, they were thought to be able to enzymatically couple this nitrate reduction with iron oxidation. Although the majority of evidence shows that there is actually, it's more of an indirect or abiotic mechanism where these nitrate reducers reduce the nitrate and then the, nit uh, the reactive nitrogen species go on to oxidize the iron. Although there is one strain or one culture, culture KS, which has been shown to enzymatically couple nitrate reduction and iron oxidation. Then, of course, to complete the cycle, we have to look at the iron reducers. And for this, we have many different cells which can do this. Um, people are studying geobacter sulfur reducers, for example, which combine the oxidation of organic carbon with the reduction of iron-3, uh, forming various different minerals. Uh, they can also use hydrogen. But now I just want to show you a few examples of the types of minerals that are produced by these different processes. So first up, we're just going to look at the microaerophilic iron 2 oxidizing bacteria. These produce some very interesting shapes and features. So you have stalk formers, but you also have sheath formers. Here on this SEM micrograph, I'm just showing you an example of a twisted stalk that's produced by one of these microaerophilic iron 2 oxidizing bacteria. They form these sort of twisted ribbon-like material. And interestingly, they fork off. And the forking itself is because at one point you had a cell which had a, a, a fiber growing out of it, which then underwent cell division and causing this branching effect. So in many ways, you're kind of seeing a representation of a family tree just in, a, in this micrograph. Clara Chan has done some very pioneering work on these organisms and has shown some amazing examples of the, these twisted stalks emanating from the side of these organisms. So they grow sort of from the side in fiber, finger-like features, um, which then eventually twist around. And she's got some amazing videos if you ever go into some of her uh, research, uh, where you can see the bacteria basically twisting around 
as the sheath or as the stalk itself grows. Now, I'm not sure if it's the uh, tail wagging the dog or the dog wagging the tail, which one is causing which one to spin, but uh, these are amazing uh, features that you can, you can see. And what she identified was that you had the cells which produce these fibers, which the fibers themselves were uh, composed of an iron three mixed with EPS or exopolymeric substances, which over time became slightly more mineralized with um, oxyhydroxides, and then eventually it got the formation of lepidocrosite crystals on the surface of the fibers. And so recently I did a study uh, to look at some of these stalks uh, using a thing called a helium, helium ion microscope, which is essentially just a very fancy SEM, but rather than using uh, electrons, it uses helium ions. Um, and here is an example of, of some of the images I was able to collect where you can see this almost like uh, spaghetti-like aggregation of the, the twisted stalks mixed with these globules. And the globules are probably abiotic um, ion minerals that are forming, but you can still see very clearly the fibers that have formed. I was interested in seeing how they might develop over time. And you can see here is just a nice image of one specific, one isolated stalk where you can clearly see the fibers uh, running alongside of each other. And maybe there's five or six, or it doesn't seem to be any defined number of fibers uh, per cell, but you can clearly identify them here, as well as the renucleation of some minerals that are forming on these cells. Now, it's interesting if you leave them for a few more days, you see these initially very, well, you could see these nice untouched uh, fibers, these very clear fibers. They now have these uh, platelets. These are the lepidocrosite platelets, which form on this template, uh, these fibers that are basically templating the, 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 the lepidocrosite. And if you leave it longer still, um, you get very large, well, these crystals start to get much larger over time, suggesting that they're in fact perhaps growing. And um, I particularly like this next image, mainly because of its uh, chaos, um, but also it's really showing this microbial involvement in templating these amazing uh, lepidocrosite structures or uh, platelets forming on the, uh, on the fibers themselves. Uh, so you can really see how these different minerals are forming over time. And I think in the back we could sort of identify what we thought was, was maybe GERT. Moving on to a different organism now, we've got the phototrophs, and uh, these typically form short-range ordered iron-3 minerals, such as ferrihydrite or perhaps gertite. Here I'm showing the example of Rhodosunomonas palastris Tai 1. Um, interestingly, they often tend to stick, or almost like they're sticking their nose into these clusters. They, they sort of stick out like flowers from central uh, iron oxide clusters sometimes. Um, anyone who's an expert on, on sample preparation please can you give us some advice on how to prepare phototrophic iron oxidizers because I don't know what it is about them, but they tend to sort of deflate and they look like these flat pancakes, no matter what critical point drying or method I use. Uh, they don't particularly work out that well. So any advice would be much appreciated. But these cells also form these quite interesting larger balls. That's all I can use to describe it. These, these, these aggregates of these iron three minerals uh, this particular thing looks a bit like the Death Star, um, and you can still and you can see some of the cells here, uh, some interesting holes every so, so often, and and um, these are just some examples of what they form. And um, well, a few years back we did some cryogenic focused ion beam SEM imaging of this uh, particular strain, and we got uh, we did develop a, a, a 3D tomography of the Rhodosunomonas palastris, which is in the yellow associated with the iron minerals, which are of course in the gray. And again, they form these large aggregates, all these big, big balls basically of iron three minerals. Not particularly crystalline. Um, they are short range ordered. They are things like ferrihydrite, uh, but never, nevertheless, the, the microbial activity is responsible for forming um, these minerals. These cells are now the, the third type, these nitrate reducers. These actually um, can be prepared really easily. I mean, you can see how nicely these come out in comparison to the, uh, to the Rhodosinomonas. Um, these are the ones that are producing the iron minerals sort of abiotically. They're actually reducing nitrate that's present in the solution, and then their abiotic component is, releasing, is 
causing the uh, mineralization of things like goethite. And here, potentially some of these plates look a bit like they could be something else. Um, we know that those green rust can be produced by these organisms. Um, and we also have other uh, autotrophic nitrate dependent iron um, oxidizing bacteria. This is the culture KS, which is the one that's uh, enzymatically uh, linked to couple, being able to couple nitrate reduction with iron oxidation. Um, again, they also form different iron minerals such as very hydrate or goethite. In this image here, which is uh, prepared and given to me by my student Tim Bayer, uh, you can see almost like cauliflower formations of these iron oxides on the cell surface itself, which is um, uh, just a very nice, interesting artifact. Onto the reducers. Uh, many of you might be familiar with Geobacter sulf reducens. Uh, these are ones that I've worked with for quite some time now, and they typically can produce magnetite nanoparticles. And here, this image just shows a nice cloud of the, the nanoparticles associated with uh, the bacteria themselves. Uh, so as you can see from this collection of, of images that I've shown you, um, we have a range of different iron minerals that are produced by the bacteria, whether it's iron oxidizers or whether it's iron reducers. They really involve in a number of different um, biomineralization pathways. But in each of these biomineralization pathways, there has to be some amount of electron exchange. Of course, if we're having iron oxidation, we need to have uh, electrons being removed from the iron two source. If we have the iron reduction, we need to have the electrons added uh, to the iron three source. So in many cases, we've been studying simple systems where we have iron two that is present in only aqueous solution. Perhaps it could be coming from iron chloride or maybe it's complexed um, with uh, some other complexing agent. But the reality is that in the environment, we have many different iron minerals uh, that are present in association with different um, species of, of iron. And what we wanted to know was, can these sort of solid phase iron minerals also be used uh, as the electron donors or as the electron acceptors? And, and so in the first question I was going to uh, address was, can solid phase iron two minerals be used by phototrophs as electron donors? And for this work, we only worked with phototrophs and green rust was the mineral that we chose. Uh, green rust, for those of you who don't know, is an iron two, iron three containing mineral. Uh, it sometimes is present as either carbonate or sulfate or chloride, um, but we chose to use the carbonate type of green rust in these systems. And this work was done by a student, Shaowa Han, who was visiting my lab in Tübingen, uh, but is now back in, in, in China. And the vototrophs we used were Rhodobacter ferrooxidans, SW2, and Rhodopseudomonas palastris, Taiwan. So we used two different types of photoferrotrophs uh, just to indicate whether or not this was an isolated effect. For this work, we synthesized the green rust, as you can see here, we've got this sort of hexagonal uh, plate type of structure. Uh, we simply added the bacteria and these were the only source of iron two that prov were provided in these cultures. There was no aqueous iron two provided, although there was a some small degree of dissolution which took place, um, but nothing uh, significant. So over the course of these experiments, Shawa simply followed uh, geochemical changes. She wanted to follow the change in iron two and iron three in the structural components. So in the, in, she did some solid phase extractions of green rust um, she would then measure the iron two and iron three uh, over time. And what you can see from these, um, these figures is that in our control group where we didn't have the bacteria, there was very little uh, change in the iron two indicating we didn't have much dissolution, if any. Um, whereas when we had the bacteria, of course, we can see a very clear decrease in iron two present in the, uh, in the green rust itself. Uh, we actually tried two different concentrations of cells, two different inocula, 10% uh, and 20%. And you can see by this increase in lag phase between those two, uh, that clearly cell number has an influence. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see the same experiments, but with Taiwan. Taiwan seems to do the, uh, the oxidation as well, though a little bit slower than we can see for the SW2. Of course, we have the iron three 
um, measured as well. In this case, we can clearly see the iron oxidation is taking place by a buildup in iron three in the solid phase. Uh, and then the controls didn't see anything significant. And as well with the Taiwan, we saw a similar effect where the, the rate of iron three production was uh, slower than we see in the SW2. We did some spectroscopy and I, I don't want to bore you with uh, details about MOSPAR because I'm sure not many people, uh, not, not everybody knows it, um, but I can simply uh, comment on the first uh, spectrum, this left hand one showing the initial green rust where we have a lot of iron two clearly present in there as well as some iron three. Green rust remember does contain some iron three already. And after we've exposed it to these bacteria, to the SW2 or Tai one, we have this orange uh, doublet and this type of doublet is very characteristic of an iron three. Uh, short range ordered phase, likely something like a very hydride. Um, although in the Taiwan, we see this green phase here, which corresponds to residual iron 2 that was still in the system. And that um, agreed with our geochemical data. So in short, uh, these results showed that, well, the question was, can solid phase green rust be used by phototrophs as electron donors? And, and our simple conclusion was yes. Uh, we observed a faster green, rate oxida uh, green rust oxidation rate uh, by SW2 than by Taiwan. Um, but what is the relevance of this particular microbe mineral interaction? Um, well, if we can have oxygenic phototrophic iron 2 oxidation of green rust, then that implies that we can have the formation of iron 3 oxyhydroxides. There is arguments to suggest that green rust was present in some of the early oceans. And potentially, this is an important mechanism for Precambrian iron formation deposition in some of these ancient oceans. So it just opens up some of the potential um, pathways which may have contributed towards uh, iron formations in these ancient oceans. Okay, now um, that's shown clearly that iron two can be an electron uh, donor um, for these different organisms. Um, but now I want to think about the other side of the cycle, the iron reduction. And typically many of our experiments will focus on iron three sources such as uh, ferry hydride, which is very short range uh, orders, very poorly crystalline, very small nano, nanoparticles, maybe two to three nanoparticles. It's typically X-ray amorphous and it's been shown for decades to be bioavailable. Of course, it's very rare that in the environment we see um, we see such pure forming ferry hydride. Um, in our iron reduction experiments, we might typically expect to see the formation of minerals such as magnetite. And uh, we know that this magnetite is present in soils and sediments, but we also know that the ferry hydride is relatively impure in many cases. And we wanted to evaluate whether organic matter associated ferry hydride, particularly organic matter that is derived from microbial activity was going to influence this iron reduction from ferry hydride to magnetite. So we had a question, what is the effect of microbial biomass on the reduction of ferry hydride to magnetite? And again, this work was done by uh, Shawa Han, and she prepared four different types of ferry hydride for this experiment. She had an abiogenic and biogenic sets of, of ferry hydride, and she had some with and without organic matter. So the simple abiogenic ferry hydrates, AFH, this was prepared through a very routine method we can easily do in the, in the lab for producing ferry hydrate. And then to try and get a, a sort of control system simulating uh, maybe some organic matter, she introduced humic acid uh, in the mineralization. So she prepared an abiogenic ferry hydrate co-precipitate with ferry hydrate or with, with humic acids. Now, she also made use of some of the organisms that we've worked with in the lab, in this case, right back to ferrooxidants SW2, this phototrophic iron oxidizer, which we, which we know produces a uh, ferry hydride, or at least a very short range ordered iron three mineral phase. And so she used that to produce biogenic ferry hydride. She then also wanted to produce biogenic ferry hydride, which had those organic uh, molecules removed. So in which case she used biogenic bleach treatment. Uh, so the bleach simply breaks down the organic matter and is able to remove this organic matter uh, to then produce this ferry hydride, which is kind of akin to the abiogenic ferry hydride, but of course it had that biogenic origin. 
when she looked at the starting mineral properties, she wanted to evaluate it for surface area, zeta potential, and compare the carbon iron molar ratios. Uh, she saw that the surface areas of, well, most of the samples were quite comparable. Certainly the abiogenic ferrihydrite, the bleach ferrihydrite, and the biogenic ferrihydrite were relatively comparable. But as soon as she added the humic acids, this co-precipitated aggregate, I would only assume we have a very much uh, diminished or much lower surface area. But in terms of zeta potential and carbon ion ratios, what we did see was that the zeta potentials of the synthetic ferrihydrite, as well as the um, bleach treated biogenic ferrihydrite were at least positive. They weren't maybe not necessarily comparable, but they're definitely positive. Whereas, uh, and then the carbon ion molar ratio showed that we definitely had a low amount of carbon in these systems. Uh, whereas when we have carbon, when we expected to have the carbon at least, uh, we had a more negative zeta potential and our carbon ion molar ratios were much higher. In fact, they were quite comparable. And this gave us a, the confidence to say that the bleach was able to remove the biomass in these systems um, without significantly changing the mineral properties. And that was important as well because we wanted to make sure that we had something relatively comparable to the original starting material. The experiments themselves were relatively simple. She had the different four types of ferrihydrite, which she added. Uh, she had an electron donor as well. In this case, it was lactate. And she added Schuonella guanadensis, uh, and she did it at neutral conditions. And the bulk of these experiments, we I'm going to focus on simply geochemical changes. So she followed the iron 2, iron 3 ratios of the solid precipitate material, so of the magnetite itself. And she also followed the magnetic susceptibility. Now, magnetic susceptibility, as perhaps the name gives away, is an excellent uh, method for following the formation of magnetic minerals. And that was the goal. We wanted to see what was the influence on the magnetite precipitation. So the magnetic susceptibility was going to give us a clear indication about how much magnetite was really being formed. So here you can see some of these results. And the red dashed line is showing the iron 2, iron 3 ratio. So again, that's in the solid phase. So it's not in the solution, it's in the solid phase in the actual precipitate itself. And the blue solid line is corresponding to the magnetic susceptibility. Um, what you can see is that in the case of having a synthetic abiogenic ferrihydrite precursor mineral, we get very rapid ion reduction and we get very rapid magnetite formation. This is not new. This is no, no different to what we've always expected uh, and seen time and time again. Interestingly, as soon as we had any level of organic matter, whether it's in the biogenic ferrihydrite, the abi, uh, biogenic with uh, abiogenic with humic acid, or in fact the bleach, we still see relatively rapid iron reduction. We see in the first few days, most of the iron reduction has taken place, although perhaps not quite as rapid as in the abiogenic ferrihydrite case. What was interesting in these results was that, well, the magnetite formation took a long time. It took almost a month, if not, if not longer in, in several cases. So in the biogenic ferrihydrite, for example, we have a very rapid iron reduction. And this iron 2, iron 3 in the solid phase, so all of the electrons are there. All of the, the stoichiometric ratio is there for magnetite precipitation. But it does not take place uh, for several days or several weeks. The transformation to magnetite doesn't take place for several weeks afterwards. Suggesting that this organic matter, it may not be influencing the actual rate of reduction so significantly but it is influencing the rate of transformation to magnetite. And we can see this for all the cases. And the biogenic bleach example, well, um, clearly we didn't remove all of the organic matter because there was still a lag of, in this case, 19 days. Though you'll, though you'll notice that it was a shorter lag phase than we see for the biogenic uh, ferrihydra. Now, what was great about these experiments was that we did get magnetite formation uh, over, over time. I frankly was very impressed with the way that Shawa persisted with these experiments because uh, as you can see, there's a huge density of data points that are, re are reaching for 160 days. Uh, there are very few students, I mean, at least I'm not sure I would have the patience to keep sampling that, that often and that frequently. 
we did uh, some mass band spectroscopy just to analyze the mineral transformation products, uh, and we could clearly identify. So, um, I know many of you probably don't know mass power, uh, are not familiar with it, but these spectra, these these are very characteristic of magnetite. At least these uh, blue and green features here, very much uh, a signature of magnetite. We do get some additional features, some poorly crystalline phases. We're not quite sure what they were. Uh, and still some iron two in many of the uh, examples. And in fact, still some iron two, iron three occasionally. But the important thing is we clearly saw a mineralization of the magnetite. So um, to summarize this particular part of the study, um, what is the effect of microbial biomass and the reduction of very hydrate to magnetite? Well, clearly the iron reduction rates are relatively similar. Um, but the biomass appears to inhibit the transformation to magnetite. So what is the relevant relevance of this particular micro-mineral interaction? Well, it suggests that the ferry hydrate is still bioavailable even when associated with microbial biomass. Um, but we need to consider that there is potential passivation of the surface, maybe sequestration of iron 2 by bacterial cells and associated biomass which play a major role in the rate of magnetite formation. And so perhaps even though um, we don't necessarily see magnetite in certain sediments, it doesn't mean that it couldn't form eventually, or uh, there could be processes that allow magnetite formation to take place. It's just they take place on a very, uh, the formation might take place on a very slow scale. Okay, so now I've just shown a couple of examples of how we can use iron 2 and iron 3 as uh, individual electron donors. But I want to have a final study, which I'm going to present to you today, um, which is some work that I presented, uh, published a few years ago, where rather than having isolated iron 2 or isolated iron 3 mineral phases, what about if you had a single mineral phase that could be both the electron donor and the electron acceptor. And for this study, um, magnetite, again, was the, um, the, the mineral of choice uh, for a number of reasons, notably uh, because it contains both iron two, uh, both iron three and iron two, meaning that it could, in theory, act as an electron donor and an electron acceptor. But also its magnetic properties help um, us to follow redox changes over time, and I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. But the question in this particular study was, can magnetite act as both an electron donor and an electron acceptor? Uh, in this particular study, I tried to simplify things with just having isolated phototrophs and iron reducers in the same system, so no microaerophiles and nitrate reducers. Although I did do a small study with nitrate reducers and saw similar effects. Um, for this experiment, I had a single bottle, or well, not a single bottle, I had uh, many replicates, but I had uh, the cultures which contain the magnetite itself, um, as well as iron oxidizing bacteria and iron reducing bacteria, so a sort of co-culture. Um, I used Rhodocinomonas palastris Taiwan and Geobacter sulfur reducers. Now, the advantages of using the phototroph is that we can use the light to control iron oxidation, and then when we take off the light, and add an organic, uh, in this case, acetate as the electron donor for the reducers, uh, then we're gonna stimulate the iron reducer. So you can cycle between these two different pro mechanisms in the same co-culture. Um, the starting materials themselves were about, uh, well, they were very much nanoparticles. They were 12 nanometers in diameter. Now I mentioned the fact that we use magnetite in this study. Um, one of the reasons was that it's magnetic, which means that we can use magnetic properties to follow redox changes. And how is that possible? Well, um, that's, we can just think about the crystal structure of magnetite and, and the way it's actually uh, composed. Um, magnetite itself contains octahedrally and tetrahedrally coordinated iron. So we have these two different lattice sites. Within the octahedral site, we actually have both iron, um, sorry, before I get to that, uh, these different lattice sites, these octahedral and tetrahedral sites, well, they are magnetic. The iron atoms are very magnetic and they um, couple themselves in an anti-parallel uh, magnetic arrangement. So think about two fridge magnets that you would, or two bar magnets that you would flip. Uh, one would be south-north, the other one would be north-south. That's basically a very simple analogy to what you're seeing here at an atomic level. 
Now, the octahedral site actually comprises of both iron-2 and iron-3, whereas the tetrahedral site only contains iron-3. Now, remember that we have anti-parallel orientations of these magnetic moments. So, essentially, we have an iron-2 plus atom, which is down, an iron-3 plus iron atom, which is down, and an iron-3 plus atom, which is up. And what this means is that these two iron-3, the magnetic moments from these iron-3 atoms cancel each other out, and we can say that the reason magnet, magnetite is magnetic is because of its iron-2 content. But what actually is because of this um, arrangement of iron-2 and iron-3, this balance, because as soon as you start to change the stoichiometry, the iron-2, iron-3 ratio, you're going to affect how magnetic it really is. And that's really useful for this study, because what it meant was that we could use magnetic susceptibility to measure our cultures without taking any samples, without interfering with the system in any real way, simply putting it in the light and in the dark. And as you can see from this figure, there was a decrease in magnetic susceptibility relative to its starting value over time during the iron oxidation phase. And then as soon as we promote the iron reduction phase, we put it in the dark and we add the acetate, then we see this very significant jump in, in magnetic susceptibility. Now we did do some uh, corresponding iron two, iron three measurements with geochemistry and they showed a similar effect. Interestingly, we were able to show this cyclic effect as well, where you could take, take a sample, take the sample and move it into the light and into the dark, reversibly so. And you would get these changes in magnetic properties over time, giving an indication that these co-cultures could either use the magnetite as an electron donor or use it as an electron acceptor. And this is really interesting because it gives rise to this concept um, or helps to support the idea that magnetite could be a biogeo battery. A biogeo battery is something that would be able to provide charge or electrons depending on the geochemical conditions. So let's, for example, consider geochemical conditions that might favor iron oxidation, such as when the oxygen is right for the microaerophiles or they have enough light or enough nitrate. Well, in this case, the magnetite is being used as an electron donor and the battery is becoming discharged. However, if the geochemical conditions change and they're more favorable to the iron reducers, well, now the magnetite is gonna be an electron acceptor and it becomes recharged, ready for, um, for the oxidizers to move in as and when they require. Um, this study, as I said, was published a few years ago, and I did um, work on it again to try and understand if this was effect was simply confined to the mineral surface. I don't want to uh, go into too much details, but um, basically what we tended to see was that the magnetite itself was quite strange in its behavior. The, the mineral itself seemed to have this strange uh, inhomogeneity of the electron distribution throughout the mineral itself and that we had a high iron-2 content towards the surface. Now, this was beneficial to the iron oxidizing bacteria because they were able to pull the electrons directly from the surface. Whereas the iron redu reducers, well, they needed to get their electrons in somehow. Um, but what, what we observed was a reduction at the core of the mineral, that the bulk of the mineral was becoming reduced, suggesting that the electrons were perhaps undergoing some electron hopping into the mineral itself, leading us to conclude that well, microbial oxidation is very much surface dependent. They can only really access the electrons that are at the surface. Uh, whereas the microbial reduction side of things were able to just pump electrons into it. It was more of a volume dependent transfer. And perhaps that is, has uh, implications for other studies, for example, long range electron transport or transfer in soils and sediments. Um, so I've kind of done a bit of a whirlwind tour of some of the, uh, some key work that I've been involved with over the last few years. Um, I'm hoping to build on this uh, in, in, in the years to come, especially in Bristol. But just to summarize what I've uh, shown you, basically I'm metabolizing bacteria. Well, firstly, they are everywhere, but they are also hugely responsible for many of the iron biominerals that we find in the environment. We see that microbe mineral interactions can occur across different phases. Not only can these electron exchange processes happen with, mineral, with dissolved uh, compounds, dissolved iron-2 or short-range ordered iron, uh, iron-3, but we can have green rust acting as an electron donor for iron oxidation. We can have organic matter associated with ferrihydrite 
which is uh, suitable for iron reduction. So this organic matter seems to have an influence on the precipitation of magnetite itself. And then we also have redox cycling, which can take place in mixed valent minerals, such as magnetite. These minerals, which contain both iron two and iron three, can support different communities. And it's clear uh, that these microbial, microbe mineral interactions have relevance, not only to modern environments, but also to potentially ancient environments. Um, just like to thank a few people, um, University of Bristol, Casey, uh, and of course, my former group in Tübingen, Andreas Kapler, uh, supported a lot of this work, uh, and various people. Uh, Shawa Han was really involved with uh, two projects which I showed today, and then of course, I've still got a few other uh, PhD students and postdocs who are working on, on similar aspects. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to advertise a PhD position which is opening up in my group. It's a, a DTP project uh, funded by NERC. Uh, and this is looking at kind of different areas of, of my research, but still related on selective recovery of critical metals from environmental and anthropogenic waste by biologically mediated fractionation. So using these uh, iron metabolizing bacteria to try and remove metals, critical metals, trace metals from uh, various different waste uh, materials. So if you're interested or if you know a student who is interested, then please either get them to get in touch with me personally or, or look on, the, uh, on some of the Bristol websites. Thank you very much. And thank you for, for your attention. Thanks, James. That was really fascinating stuff. Um, which I, like I just said that, like I didn't know it was fascinating, but I already did. <laughs> Um, so there's a question in the chat from Crispin already. Um, he asks, is James interested in translating his work to the search for biosignatures for iron redox processes in the geological record? I mean, I do think that these are fascinating. I mean, I, I guess that's related to um, sort of biomarkers. And uh, I know Crispin has been involved in this work from, from Dodd. Uh, looking at some of these micro fossils, these uh, twisted stalks, potentially the rock record, and, and I would be fascinated to see how we can, how these structures, how these biominerals actually, how are they preserved? Um, we see, we've got clear evidence that they are made, but how are they preserved in, in these different rock records? Are we getting fossils or are we able to follow geochemical um, mapping or conditions in, in banded iron formations to show evidence of, of of these microbe processes that have, have happened. Um, There's something I'm very much interested in working with. I actually have a study that I uh, didn't want to present today just because there wasn't much time, but I I've taken some, some thin films from banded iron formations recently. I've been using uh, high resolution MOS power to try and follow changes in the iron two, iron three ratios across bands of magnetite to try and see, do we have oxidation or do we have reduction? And uh, we've got some interesting results and uh, I, I'm wondering how I can take it further, but yes, definitely something interesting. There's a sec another question uh, from uh, Maurice. It says, really fascinating, thanks. We know from Rio Tinto that viruses are iron mineralized. So why not your tiny 100 nanometer initial, uh, I think that's points, are mineralized viruses, then these could nuclei for nuclei nucleate for further iron mineral precipitation. Maybe you want to double check that in the chat as well, because I read that. Yeah, in. I'm going to have to, because I don't have the chat window in front of me somehow. Uh, do I need to shop, stop Yeah, you sharing? need to close, stop sharing. Or I need to just get the chat. Ah, I've got a chat window up here. Right, okay. <laughs> I can see them now, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we tend to that the virus is mineralized, so why not your tiny uh, initial precipitate? I mean, I guess that virus involvement in mineralization would be something uh, of interest to consider. Certainly, you do need these nucleation sites. Um, I do find it interesting that when we have these, these cultures in which we have just purely dissolved substrates, purely dissolved iron two, we do get mineralization taking place. So you, you do need to have these nucleation sites, perhaps that's coming on the bacteria itself or in the glass walls of these cultures. Um, but I guess, yeah, there could be some uh, different mineralization, uh, different uh, nucleation sites to consider. Um, and viruses certainly could be, could be something that maybe they would be involved. I, I haven't looked at that, I'm afraid. Yeah, that would be really cool. Maybe if there's not a question in the chat right now, maybe I can squeeze my question in. 
Um, Because I was wondering, um, you know, you showed you can have this redox cycling in magnetite. Do you think that's kind of limited to magnetite because of the specific properties? Um, Or could you, you know, extend that to other types of minerals? Because I guess it wouldn't work for green rust because you have too much transformation. But is there certain properties that would make a mineral susceptible to be in a battery or not be in a battery? Um, This is a very good question. And actually, even when you mention green rust as as being susceptible to transformation, we also have to think about the fact that magnetite itself can also be susceptible to transformation because we don't know how far the magnetite can be oxidized or reduced in one direction or the other before it no longer can undergo this recycling effect. And so maybe something like green rust is a potential biogeo battery, but only in an extremely narrow redox window. Um, But to answer your question more specifically, I do think that there is uh, these potential biogeo batteries in the environment. In fact, I, I've got a proposal, hopefully, uh, in, in at the moment to look at these in more detail. I mean, you have uh, clays. Many of them are containing iron 2, iron 3. In clays, you have the complication of them being in sheets, and maybe you've got different sites where the, the microbes can attach. You know, you've got the, edge, uh, the edges, or if you've got the, the basal planes. Um, we also have Grigite, which is an, an analog of, um, of, of magnetite. Instead of having oxygen, it has sulfur. In that situation, it's a very complicated uh, soup of electrons because, well, you know, you could use the iron as the, as the electron donor, but maybe the sulfur is also then able to exchange some electrons uh, along the way. Uh, there are many, many potential options and something that I'm planning to pursue in, in the years to come, for sure. It sounds like you'll be busy. <laughs> um, I think there's, there's a, a related question from Mark Housen. Yep. On the behavior of magnetite and whether micronutrients might accelerate or suppress its activity. I, I predict that they will. Um, I don't know whether it's accelerate or suppress the activity. Um, one example I would say is thinking about oxyanions like phosphate. Because phosphate is very strongly binding to the surface of iron minerals. Uh, and we know if you have a lot of phosphate in your system, how does that, that influence its um, transformation rates or, or the ability for iron minerals to undergo transformation? And I suspect that if we had a lot of phosphate in the system, uh, then this might uh, potentially block parts of this activity. Although saying that, I should now remember in my experiments, I did have phosphate in the system and it still worked. So <laughs> they can't be that bad. Um, but perhaps other, uh, other things... Um, Actual natural organic matter might coat ma- uh, the, the magnetite and prevent it. Um, other ni- micronutrients might also then accelerate it if they can accelerate the activity of the bacteria themselves. Or if you have uh, electron shuttling compounds, would they also then help promote the interaction between the, the, the microbes and the iron minerals themselves without any requirement for direct contact? Uh, yeah, many different things. And we're only really at the beginning of this, of understanding these, these mechanisms. Yeah, I guess that really highlights that even when you just have a, you know, a culture bottle with one mineral and one bacteria, it's, there's still a whole load of complications before you even get to the environment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is part of the problem. How do, you, how do you accurately replicate the environment in the lab? Uh, and I think everyone working on these things is, is facing the same challenges. I do have a related question how difficult is it to you know make this put them into culture is that something that takes do you have to sort of where do you even start i mean for me the the, the, the a lot of this work is built upon previous people um, who have done the incredible job of isolating these cult the organisms from these different field sites uh collecting sediments and then going through very delicate uh, processes to try and isolate these cells. And once you have the cell, once it's clear that you can grow it on a well-defined medium, um, and in many cases the medium is, is fairly standard across the different types of iron metabolizing bacteria, then once you have that recipe, uh, then actually culturing these organisms is, is, is pretty straightforward. I mean, as Casey mentioned at the beginning, I originally did physics, and, and I, I managed to grow my cells relatively quickly. Uh, so. You know, the, these ones have been good to, to grow. Is there, 
Is there such a thing as sort of culture collections for these type of organisms or traditionally they're found in people's labs like Andreas? You do have a mixture of both. You do have a mixture of both. Of course, I mean, you know, if people, if possible, people like to submit their cultures to the DSMZ. uh, So they have it in this Mm. um, centralized facility. And that makes our lives a lot easier when we can just apply for them. But every lab has their own culture collections. That's, that's something that we need, uh, that, well, that we, even, that we have in Bristol, I know, um, where you simply have your stock that you can simply go to and access and, and, and take your cultures as and when yeah. you need it. Yeah. Works well if they can freeze. If you can't freeze them, then of course oh, you need to have these continuous oh, yeah. cultures, which then starts to consume a lot of time. Maybe I can... Oh, I think there are a couple of other questions. Um, there's a question... I just, Three more questions. Um, so one from Joanne, um, who asks, might other bacteria which don't use iron as an electron donor, but which need it to survive, associate with the um, iron oxidizers to use the iron that they produce? Um, so you said here in the question, with the iron oxidizers to use the iron two they produce? I, well, I mean, the iron reducers are the ones producing the iron two. And I guess the iron reduce uh, iron oxidizers are, are producing iron three. That doesn't really matter, but um, I I assume so. I assume that you know perhaps this is an interesting point, an interesting question that you know can uh, different organisms that don't need the iron become associated with that? I mean, I guess we have uh, these examples like the nitrate reducers where they are using nitrate, but then somehow they're also then associated with iron in these cases now. Perhaps they don't really care about the iron, or maybe um, part of the, the, the process is allowing the, the iron mineralization as a way of, of eliminating that effect of the toxicity of the, um, of the iron, because iron itself can be toxic um, to some of these organisms. So um, I, I don't know is the answer to your question, um, but I assume that there will be incidences where we could have these, these co-cultures uh, of these dependent or maybe symbiotic almost uh, types of, of, of organisms. Uh, I'll try and fly through the, the next few questions just in the last few minutes. Um, so Michelle is asking, how might microaerophilic iron oxidizers come into play in the magnetite biogeobattery scenario? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I haven't tried it. I would be interested to try it. The, the part of the problem is eliminating the abiotic component of, of oxidation when you're working with these microaerophiles because you have to use such low concentrations of iron, uh, sorry, of oxygen, um, that I assume that there will be a, a significant um, combination of um, effect of abiotic oxidation in, in this system. But at the same time, we know that if we want to grow microaerophiles, one of the techniques we use is we have a plate we stick in iron zero, the iron zero dissolves or undergoes dissolution at least, releasing iron two into solution, which is then used by these microaerophiles. I never got around to it, but I was always really interested in the idea of using the magnetite instead of the iron zero and seeing would this have a similar uh, effect uh, in being able to help grow the microaerophiles. And if we were able to show that, then that might help us to understand whether they could be used as a biogeo battery for these organisms. There's a follow-up from Maurice who asks, um, do your bacteria produce vesicles? Um, they're the same size as viruses, but a different shape, um, but also potentially mineralizable. Um, do you remove the viruses from your cultures? Good um, we don't work. With, I mean, I, I haven't looked for, for viruses, so I can't tell if there are any in there, um, but we don't specifically uh, have any involvement with the viruses, certainly in the pure cultures that we, that we work with. Um, they've been isolated by people previously, um, and uh, then we've used what we assume is to be a, a pure culture. Um, I can't tell you if there's any viruses in there, but I, I don't think there are, um, so I, I, I don't know. That's a good point, actually. Maybe one time we should check. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a follow-up from uh, Mark as well. He says, uh, I'm sure following on from the Rio Tinto comment that the heat slash dump leaching of copper sulfide ores, which relies on the leaching of iron sulfides, must be influenced by this activity. Any comment? Sure. <laughs> there is. I mean, I think uh, Kurt touched upon this last week when he was talking about these acidophilic iron oxidizers and their association with, with what's going on in Rio Tinto. Um, 
it's this acidophilic iron oxidizing bacteria are clearly there. Um, I have a former collaborator, well, still a current collaborator, uh, Sergei Abramov, who has, has done some of this research to try and see what these, what's the involvement of these organisms um, in this leaching. And I think that, yeah, there is definitely a lot of potential activity that can be uh, taking place in, in some of these cases. Um, you know, pyrite oxidation, um, what is actually going on there is a very important question. I think it's going to really help us to understand how we can use some of these different um, mining resources, maybe in order to try and get some useful um, critical metals back out of it as well. So there's a lot of work that can be done with the involvement of bacteria at the moment. Um, and I think we're still, we're still learning. That seems like a good concluding comment. Maybe we can um, can wrap up there. Um, thanks, thanks again, James, uh, for for that thank seminar. You. That was that was really really great. Um, yeah, we're, thank you. We're back at the same time uh, next week, so it's another uh, seminar at one. Um, do you want to say something about that, Patricia? Oh, it's just that it's Ben Mills, so you know it, it's a change of gears and just a bit modelling, so a bit different kind of to keep some variety there but yeah no thank you again and um the if you miss any of the previous talks they're in the youtube channel so yeah no thank you again and see you next week thanks everyone thanks again james thank you